According to the Canadian Real Estate Association, the national average home price in Canada in September 2021 was $686,000, an increase of 27% from before the pandemic. In Greater Toronto, the average home price is almost $1.1 million. In Greater Vancouver, it's close to $1.2 million. To say that housing has become unaffordable in most parts of Canada is an understatement. Two weeks ago, RBC released its latest housing affordability measure. It jumped 2.7% in the last quarter, the largest quarterly increase in more than three decades. During the last federal election, housing affordability was a top issue for millions of Canadians, especially those under 40 who aspire to own a home but feel that dream is becoming harder and harder to achieve. Welcome back to In Focus with David Coletto. I'm David Coletto. On this episode of In Focus, I'm joined by Michael Bork, the Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Real Estate Association. CREA represents more than 135,000 real estate brokers, agents, and salespeople working through 78 real estate boards and associations across Canada. Michael and I spoke about housing affordability, the politics of the issue, and what is needed from government policy to make the dream of home ownership a reality for more Canadians. I hope you find my interview with Michael useful and informative. Well, Michael, thank you so much for uh, joining the conversation. I know you've got uh, a busy week this week. You had your your pack days. Um, You had realtors from across the country meeting with uh, MPs, just as we're recording this the morning that the new federal cabinet's being sworn in. So you've got a lot on your plate. So I appreciate your time. Good to see you. Thanks, David. It's great to have a chat with you today. So, you know, uh, the Canadian Real Estate Association, your team, obviously cares uh, a lot about housing affordability, um, you know, the ability for Canadians to be able to afford the home they own, but also to, to, to buy um, into the market for those that, that aspire to do it. Um, at the start, I, I shared some stats about, um, you know, the rise in home prices over the last number of years. It, it's gotten worse uh, since the pandemic started. RBC came out with, you know, its uh, housing affordability index. It hit a, um, you know, a, another high over the last few years. Can you give me a sense from your perspective why, why this problem exists in Canada? What, what, what is the, the scale of it and, and what's the biggest factor impacting housing affordability right now? You know, I think really we're living in a period of a perfect storm as far as housing is concerned because... Um, you have a supply demand imbalance, you have COVID, you have demographic factors, which includes population growth, uh, the age of the population, uh, which I know you've studied quite a bit, as well as immigration. So let me just, you know, unpack each of those. So starting with um, supply and demand, uh, the fact is that uh, Canada has been underbuilding uh, for Many years, uh, there was a uh, report put out earlier this year by one of the large banks that uh, suggested we should have been uh, building, uh, you know, 100,000 new units over the last five years. Uh, I think it's actually probably more than that. And um, the reasons have been documented, have been studied. We know the reason why uh, there isn't enough supply of homes. And it's simply because it is too difficult to build. Uh, You and I both live in Ottawa. Ottawa is currently looking at its official plan and modernizing it. But already there's criticism that uh, we're going to be uh, 100,000, there's that number again, units short uh, of what is going to be required so that everybody has a roof over their heads. And I'm not just talking about single family homes, I'm talking about a place for people to live. So we've got this thing that I'm sure we can come back to in a moment. And then COVID has really changed people's behavior. Um, The number of people who all of a sudden uh, could not tolerate living in a 450 square foot apartment with no balcony 
when they were in a lockdown uh, as to take an extreme example, but there was many other cases too, you know, uh, families where the kids were coming back home because they couldn't go to university and uh, just needed more space. And it goes on and on. Everybody's circumstance was different, but the fact is that COVID created a lot of moving around. And then you have the demographics of it, uh, which is uh, in particular, the millennial cohort uh, just reaching that time in their lives when they could afford a home, when they were starting a family, when they were getting married and they wanted a place of their own. And this is not surprising because probably a lot of those folks grew up in a home. And so they wanted to continue the lifestyle to which they had become accustomed, I guess. Um, and then finally, there's uh, immigration. Um, you know, new Canadians are the largest group of first time home buyers. And if you're coming from another country, you're not adding to the inventory. You're not, you know, moving out of an apartment and making that available to somebody and moving into a home. You're just moving into whatever you're moving into. So it's pure demand. And we need immigration. Uh, I heard Prime Minister uh, Mulroney speak uh, yesterday saying that we really should be aspiring to be a nation of 75 or 100 million people uh, if, if we're going to really, you know, take advantage of the natural resources that we have and the, and the potential that we have. So uh, we need immigration, but the fact is that we're not building enough homes for, for people to come into and, and live in. So all of these factors have come in in, in a perfect storm at the same time. And it seems to me, you, you alluded to this, you know, the pandemic has changed for some what their priorities are, right? It used, I think for, for many, particularly in larger cities who may have had to commute to downtown, proximity to work was a big factor because the commute was just so horrible for many that, that you know, they were willing to, to put up with a smaller unit even if it didn't meet their lifestyle needs because it, it got them closer to work. For many, they may find, you know, going forward, they won't work entirely from home, but maybe two, three days a week they will. And so it's okay to move out to, let's use Toronto, Oshawa, or Richmond Hill, or even farther because it's even unaffordable in many of those markets right now, um, if you only have to commute one or two days. And so space, you know, becomes uh, more important. You need a space for your, your office, you need a space for your family. So those priorities are shifting. And I also think we've seen it in our research, home has always been a really important place for many things, for family, for, for work, for, for entertainment, for just, but it's become even more important over the pandemic because we've been stuck. So we've all had, that's why we also see a home renovation boom, right? We, we've been stuck in home. We've seen the deficiencies or the things we'd like to improve and, and millions of Canadians have spent billions of dollars up, up, updating their home. So, so I think that's really interesting. But your point about immigration, I think, is so, so important because we know that, you know, the federal government is planning to continue to ramp up, you know, the number of immigrants. And if we aren't meeting the demand that will come with that for housing, whether it be rental housing or um, to own homes, this problem seems to, to likely get worse before it gets better. Is, is that the, so what's the outlook then? So we know it's unaffordable now, but I, I don't suspect, I hope that we're, because for homeowners, I think this is a, a fear that we're going to see a, a massive correction in the price that this, this pressure that demand is going to put is means unless we ramp up supply, this will be a persistent problem. Is that, is that true? Yeah, um, th there's no question that um, the focus really needs to be on supply and it's starting to become more and more obvious all the time. Um, you know, you listen to government officials. Uh, I was uh, at a webinar uh, last week with Romy Bowers, who's the uh, CEO of the uh, Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation. Um, and she fully acknowledged that uh, supply really has to be the focus. So I think. There's no more debate about that. And the question becomes, how do we do it? Mm -hmm. And um, just to come back to one of the points you made, the, the drive until you can afford was, um, was a, uh, a pretty noticeable uh, trend before COVID. 
and uh, you started to see all of these uh, these commuters. Um, what happened with COVID, which is quite fascinating from a management standpoint or from any any which way you look at it, is that um, all of a sudden, uh, you know, the folks that had done that were were validated, and and new people started to do it because they realized that they could work from home and they wouldn't have to make that commute all the time. And I think what's happened in society is that people have realized that really that was a terrible way to live and nobody wants to go back to it. Uh, You know, I know as an employer that about a third of my employees are willing to come back full time when they feel it's safe to do so. Another third never want to come back into the office to work. And then a third want to come back about two or three days. And so you could probably uh, chart that and show that there's a very close correlation to where they live. The people who don't want to come in at all, you know, may well live an hour outside of the the office here and don't want to make that commute. And and frankly, I don't blame them because it's, um, it's a quality of life issue that people have realized through COVID that, hey, there's more important things. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons that Uh, The hospitality industry is having trouble hiring people. A lot of people have just moved on to other things because they realized, you know, I'm working too hard. I'm, you know, I don't have good uh, life work balance and uh, and I'm going to address that now. So um, there is so much going on uh, that will be studied into the future. Uh, But um, there's no doubt that we we have to focus on how are we going to build new homes and how are we going to, the hard part is how are we going to remove the impediments that exist to building homes? And I think, you know, for that, we've got to look at each other, you know, ourselves in the mirror. I'm going to come back to that because there's some interesting stuff happening in other jurisdictions that I think, um, you know, there'll be pressure on municipalities and provincial and federal governments to kind of figure out how to do it here as well. But I want to just sort of take a step back and, and look at the last federal election. Um, I can't recall, and maybe you, you've you got more experience watching elections over the years, but this past one seemed to have a greater focus on housing, um, I think, from all the parties than, than we'd seen in the past. This is not a new issue. We've been working with Korea for, for years on this, but it did seem that all of the major parties put um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to get your feedback on whether it was the right policies, but they s- certainly put a lot into the window for Canadians t- to look at. Um, all, all three main parties talked about housing sust- and over a number of days over the campaign. Um, do you think the issue got enough attention given um, sort of that focus? And, and I guess, what were your, your thoughts and Korea's thoughts on some of the ideas that were put forward by by the various parties and the, and the leaders during the campaign? Yeah, so it, it's really a yes and no. Um, yes, we were really pleased to see the focus on housing this time around, that every uh, party had uh, parts of their platform dedicated to housing. It was discussed quite a bit uh, and really coming at housing from across the whole housing spectrum uh, from people dealing with uh, people who are exper- experiencing homelessness to, um, you know, what do you do with all these uh, millennials that that want to uh, purchase their first home? So, yeah, it was good. Um, but, uh, and and some parties, look, honestly, I think the, the governing party really put a lot of uh, of proposals forward. I was surprised by how many they put forward. Uh, so I've got to give uh, them credit for that. Uh, but I, I think we're still caught in a box where federal government is looking at their jurisdiction and what they can do with the levers that they have. And we're not looking at it from a societal standpoint, from a holistic standpoint and how we can work together to really tackle the problem and to put the urgency on the problem, uh, which is building in, in a way that, uh, that will require deep collaboration across the various levels of government. So yes, really happy with the focus on housing and 
honestly no because we're still not focused on the right things and again we're all really kind of experiencing this in real time of just the clarity of the issue to me is we've got to focus on how we're going to work together to build more units faster with an urgency that this issue has never had maybe in the post-war because uh you you may know that CMHC built the town of Ajax, for example, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. after the war. They, they knew they had all these soldiers coming back and they had to live somewhere. So it's been done before. And I think we need to tackle it in a way that is much more urgent, much more collaborative than we've had so far. And I think what, just to add another pandemic impact, uh, you know, we see it in so, so many other policy areas that the excuse that sometimes policymakers give that this is complicated and it's hard and we, you know, we, we have to coordinate doesn't really work anymore when people have seen how government can re- re- respond to a crisis in terms of the, the pandemic and, and the ability for different levels of government to coordinate and for, 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 for action to happen remarkably quickly. So, you know, there is a housing crisis in this country. Um, and I, and I think that, you know, uh, in our polling, even in the, a poll we released, this is Tuesday, we're recording this this morning, you know, um, a third of Canadians said that making housing more affordable should be a top priority, higher than five or six other items that, that we, we tested. Um, and, and the vast majority say it should be a high priority for, for the new parliament as it comes into to, to office. So there's a clear focus from the public's uh, perspective, whether you want to own a home, whether you own a home, whether you want your kids or grandkids to own a home, it's, it's there. I do want to just touch on this idea, though. You sometimes hear it in the, the, the public narrative or debate about, about housing and about home ownership in particular. You know, we know that from the polling we've done with CREA that of those who don't currently own a home, particularly those under 40, the vast majority want to buy a home one day, and they see it as a really important life goal, right? It's so much so that more people under 40 rank owning a home as a top life priority than even starting a family. And I think it's often because you're not ready to start a family if you can plan for one until you've got a place to to have that family and grow that family together. But we also know there's growing pessimism, as you, as you might, it's obvious that, that people, you know, in that millennial and, and Gen Z cohort are looking at the market and saying, how how is it even going to be possible for me to save up enough to get that home in part, because every time I think I feel I've made progress, um, for example, the pandemic could have been that moment when a lot of young people could have said, Hey, my expenses dropped. I could save a whole boatload of money. We even had estimates early on in the pandemic that the housing market was going to kind of correct and and the prices are going to go down. Well, guess what? The, The complete opposite happened. So, I've made progress in saving, but price has gone up another 27%. So some people have argued, well, maybe home, owning a home shouldn't be uh, a goal anymore. Maybe we need to, to change the narrative. What do you say to that? Yeah, it's, there's no question that a lot of people are, um, you know, feeling like it's out of reach. And, um, you know, I guess I have to look at it from the way that I think and you know, I don't give up easy. So if my life goal is to, you know, have a family and have a home that's my own, then I'm going to pursue that. And so I don't think people should give up, first of all. I think they should tackle the issue where they live. So where I live in Ottawa, um, you know, there was, I was reading the local paper and uh, the people who were involved in the community were very pleased with themselves because they managed to fight off the, uh, uh, the the official plan that had uh, allowances for nine stories, uh, and now it's only going to be four stories allowed. And then later in you know in in the same issue of the newspaper, you, they they say how they you know have been arguing with the government for more housing affordability. Well, this is just pure hypocrisy. You know, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror. Yes, you're going to have you know, more apartments in your area. Uh, You're going to have places with less parking. These are requirements if we're going to have more density. 
And, um, you know, when you travel to international cities like New York and London, you don't see a lot of, you know, single family homes. You, you see a lot more apartment buildings. That's the reality of having more people in a concentrated area. And if you don't want to live in a concentrated area, you know, you can move to a smaller, uh, you know, Canada has a lot of land. <laughs> we have a lot of other communities that you can move to. So, you know, we have to start with that. And I think people should be engaged at their local level, uh, be angry and, uh, and vocalize that it's not acceptable. And, and I think you're right. Uh, we've seen all kinds of things change. You know, government said, no, you couldn't have uh, a bar on the sidewalk. Well, then when we had to eat outside, all of a sudden there's all kinds of bars on the sidewalk. And guess what? The, you know, the, the world hasn't ended because these people are allowed to have bars on a sidewalk. So uh, I think we should challenge all of these silly rules and uh, we need to challenge ourselves to stop thinking about protecting whatever it is that we think we're protecting and allow the building to happen. It, it drives me this is my personal opinion. I try not to always bring them into these conversations, but when I walk around my neighborhood uh, and I see those lawn signs that's, you know, decry over intensification. And I wonder, are those the same people who, you know, vote for political parties that put housing prior, you know, housing affordability and access high up on the list? Because you're right. It's very hypocritical to say not in my neighborhood, but somewhere else. Um, I think we need to do it everywhere and we need to think of communities as kind of sort of that 15 minute community requires more density and, and, and us to get there. Um, there was also a, I don't know if you saw yesterday, uh, there was some uh, news coverage of a CIBC economics report about the amount of money that parents in Canada have given their kids just to help them buy that first home. I think the figure was $10 billion that you've seen this transfer um, in order to help their kids. Now, not everybody has, you know, the bank of mom and dad to help them. And, and that is, is, I think we talk a lot about inequality in Canada. I think that's, that's driving that. Um, those that have an asset or, or wealth to, to, to tap into can help their kids and those who can't fall further behind. But I also wonder, you know, what are some of the unintended consequences of how unaffordable our housing market is, where you have, you know, parents, uh, I assume, entering the retirement years, you know, tapping into what might for some be the money they need to, to support that retirement in order to help their kids who they know desperately want to get into this market and see it as kind of a, a critical uh, life goal. It seems to me that that's $10 billion it's not bad to put it into the housing market, but it also could be used to help, you know, help our hospitality sector or travel, all those, those hardest hit sectors where that money is not flowing to them. It, it seems to me that um, the, the fact that we're not building enough homes is also perverting the economic system that we have in the country. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's a distortion there economically when too much money flows into any one particular thing, housing included. Uh, I do think that uh, there are a lot of parents out there who can afford to help their children. And by helping them with a home, that what they're really doing is transferring money now instead of waiting until they die and, you know, the, and the money is taxed and then flows to their kids maybe when they don't need it so much anymore. So there's a lot of that going on. Um, I certainly don't like to see where people are overextending themselves. And, um, and I think in a market like we have now, depending on where you live, because don't forget all markets are local mm -hmm. and, you know, the market in Alberta, for example, is only just coming back from, you know, being devastated after 2015. Mm -hmm. So um, it depends where you live, but uh, you don't, you don't want people, uh, taking on uh, so much debt. We're really living in a seller's market. And um, to a certain extent, people should, a lot of people should be waiting. And so, you know, renting is not a bad thing. Um, and if you want to own, uh, take, you know, maybe a little bit longer horizon, think about two, three years from now. And in the meantime, uh, let's figure out how we can 
help uh, address that supply demand imbalance. So, you know, I think um, the the people people shouldn't give up, and it's it's a it's a tough situation to be in right now, especially to feel very emotional about it. Um, but um, you know, there there is hope. I, um, I mentioned, we already talked a little bit about intensification and, and development and sort of the nimbyism that comes along with, with what um, needs to happen in terms of, of new, new housing. I, I, I've been reading up on, um, I think recently, New Zealand uh, introduced, which, which has a housing crisis as well, uh, very high home prices. Um, California uh, passed a, a law that, that changed its zoning rules that basically says you cannot prevent uh, a multi-unit home from being built on the property that may have a single family home on it right now. Right. Um, I know in, in Ontario, um, your partners at Oria, the Ontario real estate association put out a release a few, about a week or so ago that, that called on the provincial government there to change the rules because in a city like Toronto, for example, there are neighborhoods where, on a corner lot where you might be able to build a three unit apartment where a single family home currently exists, you cannot do it. It's against uh, the law, it's, it's against the bylaws. You talked a lot about collaboration, cooperation at the start. We've got two big provincial elections coming up in, in, uh, in the new year in Ontario and Quebec. Um, you know, from a national perspective, what role do you think the federal government can, can actually play in encouraging, incentivizing, and leading um, these kind of conversations that ultimately have to be, be had at the local level, as you said. Like, you know, if you're the prime minister or you're whoever the new, uh, maybe it's been announced since we've been recording this, whoever the new minister responsible for housing is, what's, what's Korea, what's your um, advice to, to how they should approach this question? So, you know, before uh, coming into the real estate sector, I was uh, in the uh, railway uh, sector and this country does a very good job on the transportation side of uh, getting together uh, with various levels of government, with the private sector, all stakeholders, to make sure that we can transport goods across the country and move people. Uh, so the federal government is very involved in these uh, transportation roundtables. Uh, making sure that, uh, for example, you know, goods that are coming in through the port of Vancouver can move through that busy city and get to markets uh, right across North America. This has not happened in housing, and the federal government should be playing a leadership role in bringing people together, all of the stakeholders. You know, it's hard work. You've got to identify uh, what the issues are, and then you've got to start tackling them together over a longer period of time. But that is not happening, that collaboration. And the federal government also has leverage. They're spending billions of dollars on infrastructure and they could make housing a requirement. You know, municipal governments uh, currently are getting away with uh, putting impediments in place of new housing because that's what their constituents were, you know, are asking. But they're getting away with doing that. Uh, while at the same time getting federal dollars for new transit systems or what have you. If you're asking for federal dollars, you should have to demonstrate that you're going to make land available or uh, intensify in, in zoning areas that are currently not, uh, or by reducing taxes or other red tape that is in the way of new building. So the collaboration piece is, um, is important, uh, but there's also, you know, a stick that the federal government has that they could be using. But you mentioned New Zealand. And I got to say that what New Zealand has done, uh, which is to say, OK, anybody can build up to three units on their property without getting any other kind of permission. That is probably the best idea that I've heard in the last couple of years for how to move forward. And I think that one is one that we're going to have to ask all parties to, to look at. Um, and I'm sure that some municipalities will, will want to say, no, we can't do that for whatever reason. Uh, but let's not forget that this is somebody's property. It's private property. 
first of all. And mm -hmm. that person has certain rights to do, to build. And, you know, it shouldn't all be at the, uh, you know, behest of government to tell you what to do on your own property. But I think that that would start a building boom locally in, in the markets that need it, that would surpass any other effort that we could, uh, that we could try. So I, I really think that one should go to the top of the list. One, just before we wrap up, I was thinking about, you know, if, if we get to a point where all of the stars align and governments across the country get together and say, okay, we're going to move on supply seems to me given we're also operating in a what what the, the economists described as the shortage economy and we know as we talked about there's the trades for a long time have had a hard time recruiting into you know different trades um, the construction sector I suspect in order to meet the demand for housing we also need to meet the demand for people to build the houses um, and I, and I suspect you can't do one without the other. So part of the, the policy going forward also needs to be, and I know there's lots of, I, I see what's happening in the provincial government in Ontario. They're working really hard to, to encourage people to enter the trades, but you know, there are going to be a lot of well-paying jobs and there are right now in this sector. Um, and we're just going to have to figure out how to, you know, encourage people to do this work because you can have all this land ready to be developed, but if you've got no one to, to actually build them, um, it doesn't matter if the policy's there. So I, I also think we have a we have to have a conversation about, you know, job labor shortages and how do we get people into those jobs. Um, and I think immigration will be a big part of that. Um, my my grandfather immigrated, uh, what more than sixty years ago to Canada and built homes. That was, I guess, it's an Italian stereotype, but nonetheless, uh, he he fit that pretty well and and built built a number of homes in 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 around Toronto. So I want to end then with, so we've got about a month or so, or just under a month till Parliament resumes. We'll have a throne speech. What does, what does Michael Bork want? You know, what's the wish list in in that agenda setting document um, to hear from the the new government as it lays out its agenda for the next few years? Well, first of all, we want leadership. You know, we mentioned I mentioned the roundtable of this sort of collaboration, but that takes leadership. So it, it's a very good start if the government has appointed, which you know I read in the Globe and Mail today, that we're going to appoint a housing minister, and that's a very good start. But we need somebody with strong leadership skills to rally people to focus them on on uh, this problem. We need the prime minister to uh, tell his cabinet that this is a priority and that the minister that he's uh, put in charge. Uh, will have the authority to to do things. Um, you know, there there's there is a certain element of um, you know skills, uh, which is provincial, and that's a good example where you know maybe there's things that the federal government can help. I, I think one of them is is innovation. We often don't talk about innovation with respect to home building, but as far as I'm concerned, this is one of the one the untapped areas that the federal government could really be involved in. Um, you know, when you look at a housing project in your neighborhood, it pretty much looks the same as it did 20 years ago. And I'm pretty sure that your grandfather could walk into any project and start swinging a hammer and he wouldn't feel <laughs> out of place. But the fact is that we should be building more of those components in factories and installing them instead of building everything from scratch with all the materials lying under the snow. So there's a there's an innovation element that is very promising that as a country, if we could uh, focus on that, we'd probably have you know, an exportable product and, and expertise. So it wouldn't be good just for solving our immediate problem, but for our productivity and for uh, you know, the, the creation of wealth as a nation. We're also looking for the government to be a little bit more flexible on some of the things that, uh, that they've uh, taken away. So for example, um, you can't get an insured mortgage for 30 years, despite the fact that the evidence shows that, uh, first of all, Canadians are very good at uh, paying, paying off their mortgage, not defaulting on their mortgage. And the average is around 17 years. So somebody might start out with a 30 year amortization because that gets their payment low enough to be able to get into the housing market. Uh, but then as soon as they get a better job or save a little bit of money or, you know, 
you know, they're paying off that mortgage. And then the next time they get a new term, they're reducing it substantially. Mm -hmm. That's what we do here. So we should recognize that and not, you know, put yet another barrier in place by preventing people from having these longer terms. And there's ways that you could incentivize them. If you're worried about, you know, defaulting, then, you know, uh, let people take out a 30 year amortization if they take a seven year term at a fixed rate. You know, so there's there's ways to do this and we just need to collectively use our imagination. So we're really looking for, you know, the leadership and the follow through uh, on this as a major societal issue. And that means that everybody uh, needs to put their shoulder to the wheel locally against NIMBYism in their own backyard, pushing on politicians at all levels to do more and to break down these, you know, so-called uh, rules of why we can't do things when we know from COVID that uh, most of them don't make any sense. Well, it seems to me that um, I think I think things are starting to align pretty pretty well. You've got the public who for, for a number of years, I think, has been ahead of the policymakers on on seeing this as an issue that that they want action on, but based on the last election and the focus that the that the major federal parties put on it, and I suspect we're going to see in in these provincial elections coming up, you know, the next five years may be the most important in terms of um, getting getting shovels in the ground and getting new homes built because uh, I don't think the public's going to accept it getting much worse than it is. So. Um, I think I think your members and 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 Korea have an important role to play in, in pushing and you have played in pushing this conversation forward and I look forward to to seeing more of what you guys you guys do. So, Michael, thank you so much for your your time today. It was a, a real pleasure. I learned quite a bit, and uh, I'll see you hopefully in person soon enough around Ottawa. All right, thanks, David. <laughs>